I'm Minneapolis Mayor R.T. Ryback, and I want to welcome you to this White House Hangout uh, via Google to talk about guns with the Vice President. We're here with an uh, all-star group of mayors here. We have Mayor Stephanie Rawlings-Blake, Mayor, good to see you, uh, from Baltimore. Uh, mayor Karen Wilson-Freeman from Gary. Hello, Mayor. How are you? How are you, Mayor? And Mayor Steve Scafidi from uh, Oak Creek, Wisconsin. Uh, it's a great group of mayors here, and we have many others who are listening. Uh, we are very, very blessed to have the vice president here. He was uh, even kind enough to wear a tie in Viking purple today. So we thank you for that, <laughs> vice president. But more important, we uh, are very, very blessed because you've done a phenomenal job fighting for us uh, to try to make our communities safer. I think all of us on so many levels have had uh, incredible experiences that uh, we hope no one ever has to have uh, about what has happened with guns in this country. And uh, no, it's not easy. And no, it's not simple politics. And yes, you have been there every step of the way for years and years. So let's start by saying thank you. Uh, we also want to just have a very informal conversation. And my job as moderator is to get mayors to do things that we're not accustomed to, which is to keep it short, not canned. We're not going to give big, big speeches. We're all very happy we're here. So let's get that out of the way. And let's just dive in and ask uh, Mr. Vice President for you to maybe uh, start and we'll have an open ended discussion. And if uh, if any of us mayors get a little windy, my job is to keep them tight. And if you do, my job is to say you're the vice president. You can say whatever you want. No, no, so, RT. <laughs> you know, I have uh, I, I've, I'm hampered by 36 years in the Senate, so I'm inclined to get windy. So stop me. But look, uh, um, first of all, the mayors have done an incredible job. I'm working with you guys uh, on, these, on the gun issues for a long, long time. And the reason I find mayors so passionate, you walk every day outside and you find gangbangers out there. You find people who are, who are injured by guns, people who are using guns to commit suicide. And they happen. You go to the funerals. You're there. You see it. And so, uh, but it's not just the mayors, as you know. Uh, um, you know, there are people on the social media. For, for example, um, you know, uh, many are posting right now, I'm told. There are thousands of people posting right now about why they feel so passionately about us getting rational about basic gun safety initiatives. And, uh, you know, th this is a pretty important day. Uh, in about uh, 30 minutes, I got to get up out of this seat and go up and sit and preside over the United States Senate on a really important vote. Um, and the irony is that in a, something where the vast majority of the people have already spoken, where 90 percent of the American people believe we should have extended background checks, not changing the criteria, just extending the people who have to get a background check from the 40 percent who don't get one now to be included, uh, that it's requiring 60 votes in the United States Senate a supermajority to get that done. And I got to go up and preside. So uh, um, this is going to be a close vote and it's going to be a uh, but I can assure you one thing that uh, that we're going to get this eventually. We're going to get this event. If we don't get it today, we'll get it eventually. And because I think the American people are way ahead of, of their elected officials. Uh, and so I've, I, I got a question for all of you. What are you feeling? What, what are you seeing? What are you hearing from your constituents on the street, Democrat, Republican, Independent? Am I right that they're way ahead of the, uh, of the Congress on this, or am I kidding myself? Let's open it up. Uh, somebody jump in. Well, I'll jump in. I mean, I, I think the overwhelming majority of Americans understand that there needs to be background checks that make sense, that stop people from having guns that shouldn't have guns. And if you make the argument that go after the criminals. One of the easiest ways to go after criminals is to make sure they don't get guns in the first place. So that's what I hear every day. I, I get emails, I get phone calls, I have discussions at community events. That's what the public's telling me. Those are simple things that we should, we should have already done, frankly. Most Americans, a significant majority of Americans believe that. We need to get that done. That's absolutely correct, um, Mr. Vice President. Um, there is a concern relative to the background checks, particularly in Indiana as it relates to the gun shows. Uh, there is a lot of activity in those parking lots. And um, when you have states like Illinois, where you have a lot of activity in Chicago, it's very easy for people to go across state lines to come over to Indiana, Gary in, in particular, and buy uh, guns illegally uh, with straw purchasers and then use them in Chicago. And that's happening a lot now. You know, uh, I, think, I think what we're, what we're hearing out, out here is pretty clear in what the polls are reflecting. 
the people are ahead of the uh, discussion in Washington right now, and they're with you and they're with the president. And uh, I think one of the challenges is we've got to keep this as simple and clear a message as we can, and we have to not let people fall into despair on this. So in simple message, this is pretty clear. This is one law should apply to everybody. We don't let 60% of the people get on the plane and 40% go without a check, and we shouldn't do the same with guns. You know, assault weapons, which is not the discussion right now, and you have fought for years on, to me that's a pretty simple message, and it's a pretty heinous one. It's the idea that we should have a person who's a mass shooter be forced to reload. Now, how low a bar is that? But that's all that's about. And this is common sense stuff. And part of the discussion that happens, I think, a lot is like people will say, well, I believe it, but you know, nothing will happen in Washington. So if the vote goes the wrong way today, then people will say, well, I told you so. Well, what I loved, Vice President, is that you said, no, you're not giving up. And I, I can't give up because I know the, the moms I've stood with on corners with dead kids and I've been at funerals and I've seen mass shootings and I've had to preside over them and I'm not giving up and I know you're not either. I agree uh, with the, the mayors that have uh, spoken about this. And the one thing I want to reiterate is that we have to continue to push forward. I was listening to one of the talk shows uh, over the weekend, and a, a, a senator from uh, Florida said that, you know, we don't need this legislation. We need to have a conversation about violence. But I was thinking to myself, as he said this, if it were your child that died in Newtown, would a conversation about violence be enough would that satisfy you that your country has responded to this issue? And my answer is no. So uh, the, the vice president, and, and thank you for, for being in Baltimore yesterday, was in Baltimore, in Maryland, where uh, we've taken some huge steps on uh, public safety with respect to our gun legislation that the, the governor uh, headed, that the effort uh, in the past session. and. We need to continue this fight. We cannot let whatever happens uh, in uh, the Senate today as the vice president presides over the Senate, whatever happens, uh, we can't stop. RT, uh, uh, if I can quickly comment. Um, you know, uh, the point that Karen made about gun shows uh, in Gary, Indiana, and throughout Indiana, you know, there are 2,000 minimum to 5,200 gun shows every year. The big gun shows, they sell a thousand, a thousand guns at one of those shows. And a significant portion of those sales require absolutely no background check, none whatsoever. Now, how does it make sense to walk in, have to walk into Dick's Sporting Goods store and give you all you give is your name, your address, your place of birth, your country of origin, et cetera? You don't even have to give your social security number. What happens is that clerk picks up the phone and calls a speed dial number, the FBI or the National Incident Background Check System, says, R.T. Ryback is in here to purchase a gun. Doesn't say what kind of gun, doesn't give a model, doesn't give a serial number. Is he qualified under the law? Within three minutes, 92% of all the answers come back and say yes or no, denied or or, or go forward. It doesn't say when denied, why denied. It doesn't say criminal uh, background. It doesn't say adjudicated mentally incompetent. It just says denied. And within 24 hours, even that inquiry has to be ripped up. There is no place in all the federal government where you can go to find out who owns a gun, what kind of gun is owned, and you don't even know the person in the NIC system, the FBI, doesn't even know whether you actually purchased a gun. You may be standing there while, you're, while, while your wife's buying sneakers for your kid playing, uh, playing basketball, and as, just as you get approved, comes by and says, I'm going to buy that. They say, we can't afford that now. You don't even buy the gun. Nobody knows. Yet, 40% of the people can have to can walk right by that Dick Sporting Goods store to the field behind the store where there's a tent, literally sometimes, and purchase a gun without any any background check at all. Last point: eighty thousand plus people a year who go through the background check system are convicted felons or adjudicated incompetent to be able to own a weapon. That 40 percent means there's got to be statistically somewhere between 30 and 50,000 who get a gun who are not qualified, probably higher. 
How does that make any sense? And the NRA, though, and the NRA and the gun groups out there are saying, this is a slippery slope. We're about to go out and they're going to force us to register their guns, or they call it registration. Nothing can be further from the truth. Well, and, you know, Mr. Vice President, we know this because in northern Minnesota, there's a guy who goes around to different garage sales and buys up guns. And then he has uh, all of those that he sells at his own garage sale. And then we track those coming into, uh, into North Minneapolis where there are crimes committed with them. Well, that's just a different set of laws for the people who buy a gun that way than the person who, as you mentioned, can go into Dick's Sporting Goods. That's not pro or anti-NRA or pro or anti-hunting. That's just two set of laws in a country that's supposed to be one set of laws. So let's say that we all agree on this, all right? I mean, I think one of the things we've got to do is figure out the politics of this. And um, I, I think that, obviously, one of the things going on in Washington is people are afraid. They're afraid to take a tough stand on things that they may think the right thing to do because they're afraid it's going to mess them up in the next election. Well, one of the messages I hope you give back to them is, you want to get messed up in the next election? Do you want to know what's happening in this country? Do you want to know what kind of a lobbying force is being built by having one mass murder after another, by having this ongoing slow motion mass murder in cities across America? Do you know how many parents are out there? Do you know how many families are hurt? Do you think they'll be quiet if somehow you look at this overwhelmingly hideous thing in Newtown and everything else and choose to do nothing? You want to see what's going to happen in an election? Well, the sad fact of the matter is any uh, person in Congress who wimps out on this thing is, uh, is not taking the easy way out. It's a long game, but I'm not giving up, and none of these people who've seen this horrible stuff are giving up. Marcy, so um, I, I, know on, none of you're, I know none of you are giving up. I want to hear from Stephanie, but I know none of you are giving up. But here's the deal. I often get asked about what, what can we do. Uh, all these people posting, for example, online now as we speak, what you got to do is not only make it clear that you support rational, rational gun safety that has no impact on the Second Amendment, but you got to say this means the most to me. For example, all those polls show 80 to 90 percent of the American people uh, think there should be background checks. It's logical to them to extend the background checks to the to the universe of people out there. Well, you know what I hear from members of Congress? I just met with one. He says, well, that may be true, Joe, but that 10 percent who doesn't agree, they're going to show up. They're going to show up and vote. And that 90 percent thinks it's a good idea, but they're not going to vote for me or against me because uh, how I vote on this. you got to make clear. People have to make clear this is important to them. This is not just another issue. This is one of the big important issues for that 90 percent who think we should extend this. Uh, Vice President, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that we need to show that it's important across the board. The thing that we can all agree on is no one wants to go to another funeral. Uh, two weeks ago, I went to a double funeral. A mother buried two sons who were killed at the same time. I That was one of the most heart-wrenching things I ever experienced. But it's also important to our law enforcement, our police officers, who are out here serving and protecting every day uh, to have some level of security that the guns that are on the streets aren't in the hands of the wrong people. And so not only is it important to families, to parents, that should be enough. But it's also important to law enforcement officers. And if you're concerned about who's going to vote about you, then vote for them. Right. Can I ask Steve a question and bring into this, you know, this is uh, the discussion right now is all about Newtown. Well, Mayor just mentioned a great example that all of us have is we've had these different incidents. So it's not just about Newtown. But in Oak Creek, you had a horrible incident. You know, how long ago now? How many months ago? It was August 5th of 2012. And, and you know, go back to those victims and try to keep them engaged in all of this. Have they given up working on this issue? They have not. They're, they're so involved, uh, both in our community and both nationally, in a lot of different uh, initiatives. But when I met with them the day after uh, the shooting on August 5th, that Sunday, they, they asked me to stay committed on this issue. Um, obviously, obviously, I come from a gun-owning gun state, lots of law-abiding citizens, and they, and they worry and they express to me in the emails and phone calls and conversations that they worry about that their Second Amendment rights are going to be eroded by any action that's taken. But for me, it's always been... Uh, 
leadership is about taking action, action and getting results, not leading by fear, not being afraid to take a stand on things. I know that it's not popular to take stands on some of these issues, but I, that's not how I would do business. That's not how I, I live my life. They've asked me to get involved on this issue. They know it better and closer than anybody else because they lost six members of their families on that day. So my commitment is to do that, and I'm going to do whatever it takes within the Second Amendment to make sure that these things don't happen, and that's really what our role should be. Yeah. You know, what you you know Mr. Vice know. President, you mentioned a couple times you want us uh, using social media, and especially right now, anybody listening should be doing this because there's a vote going on. What messages are most important? What would be most powerful right now? I, I think there are three messages. One, a lot of these guys and women up in Congress say, well, I'm going to have to look the NRA in the eye and the, and, and, and the gun groups in the eye. Well, that's true. But you also have to look those parents in the eye. Those parents of Newtown are up there. They're sitting there. One of the women that lost a child, I don't have permission to use her name. I had all the families to breakfast at my home before they went up. This is uh, the day before yesterday. And she's asking me, what do I say to the senators we're going to talk to? I said, well, just tell them what, you, what happened. She said, how can they not do something? Quote, my little girl was hiding in a bathroom, and this man shot her through the heart. That was a phrase. The other father said to me, look at me, and he said, you know, they always say, these, these gun uh, lobbying groups, they say, guns don't kill, people do. Well, if people kill, why don't we keep the hands out, guns out of the hands of the people who kill? You know, the NRA supported. I was the guy that was writing this legislation in 1994. They supported background checks back then. And what the second thing people should say is there's not a single change in what is being done here. We're just extending to everybody not even everybody, to probably 60% of the remaining 40% were extending the requirement of a background check. There's still holes in this, still holes in this. But it's nothing new. There's no nose under the tent. There's no Second Amendment right loss. For example, Justice Scalia, in the last case, it was a Washington, D.C. case that went to the Supreme Court, acknowledged that the Congress has a right to eliminate certain types of weapons, weapons of war, my phrase, not his, that is totally constitutional. We have a right under the Second Amendment to say convicted felons shouldn't be able to own guns. There is no, zero, no infringement on the Second Amendment. Not one, not one single thing being proposed. You know, Mayor Rallings, Blake, I wonder if you could um, think this through, too, as we think about how we can go back to our communities and engage this, because, you know, gee, how can I look in the NRA after I take a vote? Well, how about looking in the eyes of Taisha Edwards, Brian Cole, Hexan Printing, or any of the people, the, the individual or mass murders in my town? And Mayor Rallings, Blake, I'm sure you've had plenty of personal experiences with this, this too. I wonder if maybe we should be asking them to look in the eyes of, you know, the folks of Baltimore who... That's why I have such a hard time understanding how knowing what we know about what's happening on the streets of so many of our cities every day, how the, the thought that inaction is even a possibility. You know, one of the things that I'd like to talk to the vice president about is the fact that you know, we've seen significant decline in violence in Baltimore over the last decade. But we still know there are too many illegal guns on the streets of Baltimore. And in Baltimore, I know that the, the vice president had mentioned how you can go into a Dick's Sporting Goods in some areas and, and, and purchase a gun. In Baltimore, we have one, uh, one gun store, one gun store in the entire city. Yet uh, too, for far too long, our city has been flooded with illegal guns that are coming in from up and down the 95 corridor. You know, the, the vice president noted yesterday about the strong uh, gun control legislation that we were able to get through the Maryland legislature, but our laws are only as strong as, uh, or only as, as good as our neighbor's laws. So we really need the federal government's help. And I'm looking for ways that we can partner uh, as mayors across the country to figure out ways that we can uh, fight these illegal guns that are coming into our cities. Stephanie, if I may. One of the things that we feel very strongly about is a federal anti-gun trafficking statute. There is no federal law right now. And so we say that if you go into a store 
and you're able to buy a gun, but you're buying it for the express purpose of giving it to selling it to someone else other than taking it home as a gift for a family member, then you are violating the law because that's how straw purchasers work. They go out and they go to various gun stores. They go to the, uh, uh, these gun shows. They buy these weapons. They're legally able to buy them. And they then take them out and they sell them to a profit for a third person to a, to, a, to a third party who then goes out and and gets them engaged in this stream, which is a major racket of gun trafficking. And for example, one, one of the groups I met with, Stephanie, uh, a, one of the, of the 228 groups we met with in drafting what we would propose to the president was a teacher. And she said, I asked my, I think it was fourth grade class, don't hold me to the class, but I think it was fourth grade, and said, well, where can you buy a gun? He said, oh, I'll show you. Come outside, the black truck, the black truck. Amazing. Every neighborhood and every major city has the equivalent of a black truck. Why? Because straw purchasers provide the flow of these weapons into other people's um, uh, uh, in these organized crime or groups that then go out and sell it to gangbangers, sell it to people who should not have and cannot have a gun. And, but you can't state to state do that. But if there's a federal law, if there's a federal law, Stephanie, that says you can't go to Virginia and you can't be a straw purchaser and sell a weapon to somebody who doesn't have a bag that you don't know for certain has, is, is able to own a gun, then you're guilty of a crime. That will put a real pinch on how many of these illegal guns end up in your city. I agree, and, and sign me up. Uh, to be an advocate uh, for that, I, I think it's essential that that we stop the 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 trend of legislating to the exception. Because as you're talking, I'm sure someone listening is saying, "But oh no, you know what about in this one instance when that it could it should be possible?" Well, that's the exception. And the rule, the majority of times, those straw purchases that you talked about are flooding our streets with these guns, and they're putting in putting them in the hands of people who we know are damaging our, our communities. Uh, I think we need to also be concerned about the whole movement that's afoot to gain reciprocity for the concealed carry. So if I have a gun permit in Indiana, then it's valid in Illinois, it's valid in Michigan. We have to be very careful about that because that cuts in the opposite direction. Well, as a matter of fact, Mayor, one of the leaders of the Republican Party is going to introduce an amendment today or tomorrow that effectively begins that kind of process. It's not likely to bring the concealed and carry exception into play. But for example, it's going to say that we have background checks. But the truth is, it's not background checks. What they say is, we're going to reform the existing background check system, which means that you're going to be able to say to a state that the federal government, or the state will be able to say the federal government can no longer, if there, someone is adjudicated mentally incompetent by a federal agency, that they shouldn't be able to do that. They shouldn't be able to deny the sale of that weapon to someone because at a federal level you're adjudicated that way. There's all kinds of things that are happening now where not only are they resisting the rational approaches we're talking about, but they're trying to loosen the existing laws, which are already too loose. And uh, it, it just, it makes no sense, and we got to make sure we don't let it happen. But that's how far they've gone. Instead of saying, I understand the problem, and I acknowledge we got to do something, they're saying, you know, I understand the problem. What we do is right now we have too, much, too, too many laws. We keep guns out of too many people's hands. We're going to let more people own guns, who in fact now are denied the right to own guns. That's coming. Mr. Vice President, one of the things that uh, we also have is, is when we get down with law enforcement, there are a lot of detailed issues that matter a lot. And they're not part of this national debate right now, but I worry about them in this whole amendment process. Um, all of the t Hart amendments basically are very detailed issues. And obviously, you've been the lead on this, so you get, get what we're talking about. But when I'm standing on a corner with a parent and a child who's dead, I want to be able to say, where did that gun come from? And I have trouble with that because my cop can't work with the ATF because Congress won't, A, allow them to share information, and B, won't let a lot of things be on a computer, which, you know, kind of makes as much sense as telling the Treasury they have to use an abacus. It's nutty, all right? 
The second thing is if there's mental health uh, involved in all of that, the national system we have, the registrations and all that are voluntary. Minnesota happens to be involved in that. Other states don't. So somebody with a severe mental illness who comes across the state line tracking somebody, uh, harassing them, maybe it's domestic violence, you know, all of this stuff wraps up together. Well, one of the things that I'm afraid of in this amendment process is all those little chinks in the armor are going to come up. And uh, we need to win on background checks, which I know is a very heavy lift right now, but we also need to keep the public aware of the fact that when people start messing around with these quote unquote details, they matter to that person on the street who wants to know where that gun came from. Details you matter. Know, and look, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Mayor. Please, you go no, ahead. No, after you, Mr. Vice President. Well, the point I was going to make is no matter what happens today on the vote up in the Senate, uh, the president's already acted to lift those restrictions on being able to gather information about the gun violence in America. And uh, not only that, we're moving forward, and the president's proposed everything from a $100 million proposal to begin to map the human brain so we know whether the neural pathways of 10-year-old kids watching four hours of violent video games affects their behavior. We know that the mental health is most needed and most urgent, and people ages between 16 and 25 were making significant proposals to fund availability of mental health and focus on that cadre of, of, uh, of, of our young people, because that's where essentially overuse, I mean, oversimplification, the brain is stamped. That's where things happen. That's where help is needed. But uh, what we've also done is we have lifted those amendments, which we argue are not we're not legally binding on the administration, those Teahart amendments that said that, the, that the, for example, the CDC can't compile information. We disagree with that. How can an, an informed society, how can we be afraid of the facts? We can't. And so we are moving ahead. And there's a lot of things that are going to happen, RT, that are uh, that whole promise beyond legislation. For example, I'm working with the Office of Science and Technology with a brilliant guy who runs that office now and bringing in a group of scientists. You know, you can build a gun now, make a gun now that can only function if the biometrics of your hand allow that, that trigger to be pulled. And we're moving in a direction where someday, in not too distant future, it's going to be cheap enough that you could put that on every single gun without increasing the cost of the gun. So the only person who could fire the gun is the person who legally purchases that gun. So there's a lot of things we're doing relating to research and development that we're insisting on, no matter what the Congress does, no matter what they said. Now, they can deny the funding for it, but they can't deny us being able to move forward and the research be done. Mr. Vice President, you, you know that law enforcement is a big part of this, and I know that the, the president has made comments about adding police officers. What commitment is he going to make to the, the citizens of the United States on that side of it? Because a lot of people talk about go after the criminals, enforce the laws. What's the president willing to do on that? Well, all these things we have to do, and what we're going to do is, you know, back in 94, I wrote a bill that was called the Biden Crime Bill to put 100,000 cops in the street. You guys and women know better than anybody, with the recession that you paid a big price for, a lot of you had to lay off sworn badges. You had to lay off police officers. What happened from the day we passed putting 100,000 cops in the street in 94, the percentage of people murdered by a gun dropped from 6.6, .6, I believe, per 100,000 to 3.4 per 100,000. So cops matter. That's why we proposed to add back 15,000 cops in the cops bill. So you folks out there who are pinched by this recession are able to get federal help to go out and hire police officers. Because we know if you have more cops on the street, violent crime goes down and gun crime goes down. And the point that I think that, that Stephanie was raising, I'm not sure it was Stephanie, one of you were raising is, you know, we find in those states that have extensive background checks, 35 percent fewer domestic murders, 35 percent fewer domestic murders. The point is that the, all of these things add up, making sure you have more cops on the street and enforcement, making sure that you have more extensive background checks, making sure that you have school safety programs where you train 
teachers to be able to identify those markers for real pathology in kids, not to treat it, but to get them treatment, increasing mental health availability. All these things matter. There's no one answer, but every one of them, every one of them, including limit the size of magazines, will reduce the number of people victimized by a gunshot. You know, uh, Mr. Vice President, I would also add to that just the opportunities that are available to these individuals who are perpetrators of illegal violence, uh, illegal gun use, whether you're talking about uh, employment opportunities, whether you're talking about educational opportunities, and that's both uh, prior to them getting involved in the activity and then when they are incarcerated and they come out. When they come out, they have to have an alternate course to follow. Well, you know, you're absolutely right, Mayor. The last bill that I got passed with my name on it before I became vice president was called the Second Chance Act. And a very good friend, the senator from Pennsylvania, Senator Specter, and I fought like the devil to get that passed. Because they, we knew what you know. You know, a significant portion of the people that were released from jail in your city, in your county, in your state, and from a federal prison today, they've served their time. A significant number of them end up under a bridge because they get out and they get a bus ticket and a stipend. That's all they get. They've been in jail for a year, two, three, five, seven, ten, and we're surprised they go back. So we propose that there be everyone released from prison have free drug counseling, that it continue. It's in our interest that they have access to housing to get them started, that they have some means by which, other than getting on a bus with a few bucks in their pocket and end up literally under a bridge in your town, RT, sleeping there homeless. And it's in our naked self-interest to do that. That's the reason to do it. And we should give this, and this act gives the states and the cities, it gives them money for demonstration projects, how they can reduce recidivism. Because, you know, if you don't have a job, if you have no place to live, if you've been in jail learning bad habits for the past eight years and you get out and there's no hope, guess what? You go back. You go back to crime. Well, we want to thank you so much, Mr. Vice President, for a great amount of time. And on behalf of uh, Mayor Stephanie Rowlings Blake of Baltimore, Mayor Karen Wilson Freeman of Gary, Indiana, Mayor uh, Steve Scapiti of Oak Creek, uh, Wisconsin, I really want to thank you. Uh, for staying with it. We're obviously totally with you here. I hope anybody listening is active, especially on social media right now, getting to the people uh, in the Senate, but also know that this issue isn't going away. And you've stayed with it for decades in politics, and that means an enormous amount to the people who uh, have lost so many loved ones in our community. So we're right there with you every step of the way, and um, let's just keep up the fight. Thank you so much. Um, my compliments to you, you folks. I mean, it's the mayors. You are that old trite expression. You're where the rubber meets the road. You know it. You know it better than anybody. And I've noticed Democrat and Republican mayors, there's virtually no difference. And this should not be political. This is not a political issue. This is a simple, common sense issue. And people up in, I'm about to go up for the vote. They just gave me no time to leave for the Hill. I hope to God that there are 60 people up there that have the courage to stand up and understand that this is, doesn't take that much courage. The people are with them. The people are with them. Thank you we'll all. Be watching Hell, intently. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> we, we have your back, Vice Mr. President. Vice President. For sure. Way, go to whitehouse.gov if you want to know what we're doing down here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.